There's far more that we could say about that, but in a nutshell, I, I think we can find that here. And continuing on verse 13, Now on the day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing, the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans attacked and took them, and they all slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven, burned up the sheep and the servants, and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands and made a raid on the camels, and took them and slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another, another also came and said, Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. Behold, a great wind came from across the wilderness, struck the four corners of the house. It fell on the young people, and they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Talk about a tough day, huh? That is a tough day. And we can see that God has allowed Satan a measure of control over the elements, an opportunity to an opportunity to harass humankind. Satan has allowed a measure of control. How does Job respond? Job chapter 1, verse 20, Job arose, he tore his robe, he shaved his head. That was the response of people at that time. He fell to the ground and what? He worshipped. Really, Job? Wow. That's what you did, Job? Wow. What an example, huh? In the midst of his sorrow, his agony, how does he respond? He falls on the ground and he worships God. That's a testimony to us. Job chapter 1, 21 and 22, Job says, Now naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I will return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. What a testament. Amen. Have you ever said those words? Have you ever felt that way? I imagine some of us have felt that way, huh? I have felt that way. Wow. Sometimes, sometimes we, we wish that Wow, that God would even take our lives and, you know, the Bible is the Bible's real stories about real people, amen? And this is a real story about a real man who had suffered tremendous loss, and he feels like he's lost everything. He really has lost almost everything other than his wife. His wife is all that's left, and so Job is, he's struggling, but he doesn't curse God in this. He recognizes that God is still a God of love through it all. And even though he wants to die, he says, God, your name is blessed, even so. Even so. Even if your name is blessed. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. And he still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to ruin him without cause. There is no explanation sometimes for sin, for sin and suffering, is there? There's no explanation for the 
trials and hardships, we cannot, in our finite human minds, explain why things happen. Why things happen. Can we explain why Donaldo died this week? I can't explain it. He's a good man. I, you know, I love him as a brother. He, I can't explain it. I cannot. We can't explain it. Teenage daughters, a wife, a healthy body still, loving the Lord and doing, you know, what Donaldo's conscience tells him to do. I, I can't explain it. We can't explain even sin itself, right? And so, God says, Satan answers, brother, the Lord, and says, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. Sure. Job's all right, because you haven't touched his body yet. That's how Satan thinks, isn't it? He wants to take everything precious from us. However, you put forth your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, he will curse you and your face. Lord, have mercy. So the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your power. Only spare his life. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Lord, have mercy. I didn't know what a boil was until I came to the tropics, but <clears throat> when I was just still, when I was not so old, not so, a little bit younger, <laughs> I had a boil, I don't know how many years ago, and it was a boil here on my leg, and um, at first I didn't know what it was, and I didn't realize what it was until it was already really bad. Anybody ever had a boil? If you live in the tropics long enough, you'll know what a boil is, huh? <laughs> it, it does happen in more temperate climates, but I don't think it's as prevalent. Something about the humidity, the heat, and so forth, and so... I got that boil on my leg, it got to the point where I couldn't even walk. I was just in desperate pain. I wouldn't say it was the worst pain of my life because I've had some pretty bad pains, but it was pretty, it was really bad. So my wife took me to the clinic. Somehow we got in the car with me crying like a baby, and we went there to see Dr. Hugo Leon, and he said, Brother Matt, what are you doing? <laughs> He said, you should have treated this with hydrotherapy. <laughs> and um, so he began to squeeze that thing, and I cried like a baby. <laughs> I don't know if half the clinic heard me. I was in pain. I was in pain. He lanced the thing a little bit, and he squeezed, and pretty soon all of that nasty stuff came out of that boil, and it started to heal. I still have a scar there from that, that boil. So when Maverick called me a week ago and said, I have a boil in my leg <laughs> in a similar place, I knew how he felt. Now, I'll, I'll, just a side note here. If you even think that it's a boil, I know there's a difference between a pimple and a boil. I'll tell you that. When you start to feel that little bit of pain, wherever it is on your body, I tell you, you get a hot washcloth, and you put it, in, put it in the microwave, a wet washcloth, and you put it on that boil. Just a side note here, it's not part of the sermon, but you put it out of that boil and you do it at least twice a day, maybe three times a day, and I tell you it will go away. It makes those leukocytes do their fighting best. It makes the, is that not right, the leukocytes? It gets the body, it helps the body's immune system and gets the blood flowing in that area, and every time, I have not had a boil since. I, well, I should say a boil was starting, and I'll tell you it goes away. So just a side note there for you that you can treat a boil, but I, I don't know. In Job's case, you know, the devil likes to mess with us, huh? Is that true, church? The devil likes to mess with us, and the devil was intent on destroying Job, and he didn't cause just one boil, but his whole body was covered with boil boils, and I would say, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Oh, man. If... If, it, if you wanted to die, if you felt like dying, you would want to die when you have boils all over your body. Lord, have mercy. And so Job, Job had them from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. He couldn't sit. He couldn't lie down. He couldn't stand up. It didn't matter what position he was in. He was in excruciating pain. I want to suggest to you, church, that Satan is at times allowed to bring the disease upon us. I can testify to that. Some of us can testify to that. Even when 
We do the very best we can with our health. Sometimes there are even autoimmune diseases that even today that uh, medicine can't explain. And the devil, sometimes he, he is allowed to have some sway on us, and God has a reason through it all. I believe God has a reason through it all. I can testify to that. I, 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 don't, I don't believe that I did anything in, my, in the case of my health to bring on my autoimmune disease, my Graves' disease, which is a hyperthyroid condition. Um, I was wasting away. If I ha- had allowed that to continue, the, the endocrinologist, the person who treats the, um, people with endocrine problems, said eventually she sees people end up, and we have a brother here that was attending uh, Lee and Addie's um, daughter, had a, a boyfriend, I believe the same disease as I had, he ended up dead. He was untreated, untreated Graves' disease. He ended up in cardiac arrest at the hospital, was not able to be revived, and an endocrinologist told me, I have had several patients, and I knew she had been called for that case, um, for that guy. It's about the same age as me, and so, um, I, I praise God, by the way, for modern medicine. Amen? I tell you so many times, my mom wouldn't be alive today if it weren't for mod- modern medicine. God uses uh, modern medicine today to help us. Fa- praise God. Modern dentistry. Amen? Praise God. Praise God for these things that, that help us and allow us. By- God, you- God gives man wisdom. Amen? He gives us the ability to study these things and to research and to understand. And many times disease is treated. And um, so... In my case, I don't know if you saw me, but my eyes were about to pop out of my head. I praise God that God had given man wisdom to be able to provide a treatment for me, even though I know my eyes don't look normal today. Kids look at me and some of them say, oh, your eyes are weird. (laughs) My cousin's daughter's, oh, scary eyes. I praise God my eyes look like this and they don't look like they looked a year ago, amen? And so, we can't explain it. Why God? But God has a purpose through it all, and he allows, he allows the devil sometimes to do things. He allows it. We live in a sinful world. He has a purpose through it all. Amen? He has a purpose. You may have heard Dr. Ng's testimony just a few weeks back about his son who was born with this, uh, this horrific condition, right? And how they lived through that. Eventually, he lost his son. What a challenge for the parents and for the child. God has a purpose through it all, I believe. Satan is, at times, he's allowed to bring disease upon us. It's clear from the book of Job. Job took a pot shard and scraped himself while he was sitting among the ashes. And his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Lord have mercy, even his wife turned against him. Job was in a hard spot, isn't he? Wasn't he? He was in a difficult position. How will Job respond? How will we respond when we feel like we've drawn our last, last breath, when we feel like, feel like God has abandoned us. Feel like, and Job, Job was far more righteous than us, amen? I mean, he's a righteous man without fault, the scripture says. And here Job is suffering this affliction of no fault of his own, even though his three dear friends, <laughs> his friends, <laughs> told him otherwise that it was his fault. Was it Job's fault that he was suffering all this trial, this tribulation? It wasn't his fault, was it? It was a result of that thief. It was a result of that thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. His wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Brothers and sisters, will you hold fast to your integrity by God's grace? It's hard in our own strength, amen, but we can say, with the Lord's help, I choose. I choose to hold on. I choose to hold on. You can say it another way. Will you choose to hold on to Jesus when life's, when life's most difficult challenges are thrown at you? Will you say, with the Lord's help, I want to, I will choose to, no matter what, Many, I look in this church, and we've gone through some tribulations, some of us, huh? We've gone through some trials. I was there in the hospital, and I tell you, I believed it was my last breath. My wife knows. I was telling the doctor, I'm dying. I, I could not breathe. I could not breathe. When they took me down to ICU, I believed I was dying. 
Some of you have gone through that. Some of you ex have experienced that. God is with us even in those times when our, we are drawing our last breath. And he said to her, Job said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? Job's there. He wishes that he could die. He feels like he's going to die. And, and what does Job say? Only good? Are you going to only bless God when life is good? Are you only going to praise God when life is good? Or are you going to accept adversity too? Because trouble's going to come. We live in a sinful world. We live in a world that has fallen. We have a song that says, I could blame it on Adam. I could blame it on Adam. It was grandpa's fault that I'm in this state. We were talking about that at Sabbath school with our, with our adult Bible study class. We could bring, blame it on grandpa or great-grandpa, but we have a choice, amen? We can choose salvation. We can choose Jesus. We can choose in the face of adversity to say, I will choose to praise God in the midst of the storm. And I'm not saying that we're going to praise God for the boils, okay? I'm not going to praise God for a boil. I don't know about you. If you want to praise God for a boil, you can. I'm not going to praise God when I'm in ICU, but I'm going to praise Him in spite of being in ICU. I'm going to praise Him for who He is. Because that's what we can praise Him for even in the midst of the trial, in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of grief. Grief, We can say, God, I know you're still on your throne and you have a purpose. You have a plan for my life. There's a reason for everything. I don't understand it. I don't understand why. I don't understand why Donaldo's gone. I don't understand why he's snatched away, but I know the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And I know that you're still on your throne. Amen. You have a reason, I believe. That's what we can say. Thank you, sister. You have to come more often because my congregation sometimes has trouble saying amen. When I went to the Korean church, <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you, Auntie Patty, for saying amen too. Amen. <laughs> when I went to the Korean church, I could see they have a spirit. <laughs> they talk back. In all this, what did Job do? He didn't sin with his lips. And you know what? It's okay to talk to God, amen? The psalmist talked to God. He talked to God. Talk to God about your problems. Keep the conversation going. Lord, I don't understand. Lord, I'm in pain. I'm struggling. I don't know why this happened. Father, please help me. Give me strength for today. I don't know why. I don't know why. You don't know why sometimes. But talk to God. Keep the connection open with Him. He's, he can handle it. Amen? He can handle it. You know, sometimes kids say they hate their parents. Now, Beth and I don't have any kids, but we've had some kids who said they hated us. <laughs> it was a little bit painful and a little bit hurtful, even though they weren't our own kids. But I can imagine far more painful when it's your own kids and they tell you that. God can handle it. You tell Him you hate Him, He can handle it. He can handle that. Talk to him. Keep the communication open. Talk to him. He can change your heart. If you'll just keep talking to him, communicating with him. And Job, in all of this, he did not sin with his lips. Job chapter 2, verse 11. And Job's three friends, you know, I, I, I can't pick on them too much because they're human, amen? They did come. He, they heard of all this adversity that had come upon him. They came, each one from his own place, Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, Zophar, the Namathite. They made an appointment together to come to sympathize with him and to comfort him. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So they, they did a little bit of comforting, okay? So, <laughs> so... Job chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. When they lifted up their eyes at a distance and did not recognize him, they raised their voices and wept, and each of them tore his robe, and they threw dust over their heads toward the sky. They did have some compassion, amen? They did grieve with Job, and they sat down on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights with no one speaking a word to him, for they saw that his pain was very great. So, okay, they, they did something good, amen? Can you say they did something good? 
Now, they could have kept their mouths shut for more than seven days, amen, but they kept their mouths short for se- shut for seven days. I know sometimes I heard so many people here say, be strong. At a funeral to the, those people that are suffering, be strong. Don't say that to people who are in grief. Don't say that to people who are suffering. They need to weep. They need to grieve. They need to process this. It starts as a shock. There, there are emotions. Don't be, don't, please don't. And I'm not picking on you. If you've that's what you've been accustomed to, but, but prayerfully ask the Lord to st- stop saying, be strong. Jesus is strong when we're weak, and we're weak when we've lost someone, when we're suffering and grieving, and there's a time to be silent. Amen? The Holy Spirit says an encouraging word to you to share. Okay, then share it. But, and don't say, I know how you feel. You don't know how someone feels, even if you lost your spouse, even if you lost such and such, you don't know how the other person feels. You might be able to say, I lost someone, and I, I understand what it means to grieve, but you don't know how that person feels. Everybody responds differently. Everybody is different. So we can have compassion, and we can be there with that person. We can love them and embrace them, be there however they need to, need to be there, but we don't know how they feel, okay? We don't. So let's erase that from our vocabulary and not say in any situation that we know how someone feels, because we don't. We don't. Sometimes that's painful when somebody says, and you've heard maybe young people sometimes, you know, they'll tell you, you don't know how I feel. Have you heard someone say that to you? You don't know how I feel, because it's really true. We don't know sometimes how other people feel. Many times we don't know how they feel. Each person has a unique experience, so we can just grieve with them. And sometimes silence is it's, it's grand. It's beautiful. Just to be there to comfort that person or whatever they need. And sometimes people need space. People grieve in different ways, huh? Whatever you need. If you need something, I want to be able to help. If you're serious about that, be that friend. Be that, be that brother or sister who's willing to be there and help however they can, but to allow that person to grieve and go through that grief with their own process and just to be an understanding friend. And so, praise God, these friends, they were silent for seven days. If only they could have kept their silence. Satan can bring disease and even death upon us. Satan can bring disease and even death upon us. The Bible says in John chapter 10, verses 10 and 11, Jesus says the thief comes only to what? What does he come to do? To steal, to kill, to destroy. Who is it that does those things? It's Satan who does those things. It's not God. God took him, you've heard it said. Now God 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 does allow things to happen. It is within his power to prevent... And I'll tell you, I guarantee you in the life of Donaldo, I know in my life we can all testify that God has prevented our deaths over and over again. Our guardian angel sometimes are working overtime, huh? Amen to that? Riding a motorcycle, brother? The Lord's watching over you, amen? <laughs> the Lord's watching over us. Many times he prevents our death. Sometimes we didn't, many times... We didn't even realize that we were at the brink of death and God protected us. And we ask, well, why didn't God in this instance or that instance prevent death? We don't know. At some points, God knows. God knows and he will allow things to happen. It doesn't mean he's not on his throne, amen? The Bible says it's appointed unto men once to die and after that the judgment and everyone faces the death There are only those who are alive at Jesus' resurrection that will not face death. And one other guy by the name of Elijah and one other guy by the name of Enoch. Those are the only people that didn't taste death. The rest of us, death is a guarantee. And so, there is an adversary. And I lay death at his feet. He's the one who brought sin and introduced it to our our great 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 grandparents what did jesus come for 
He came to give us life, amen? He came, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. You ask, how can it be a more abundant life? Maybe Job asked that question too, huh? Job asked that question too. Abundant life, Lord? There's a peace that passes understanding, amen? If I were Janetta today, I'd be hiding somewhere, honestly. She has somehow. I don't know what's going on in her heart. We'll just keep praying for her. Maybe there comes a day when she won't want to come to church for a Sabbath or whatever, but... God gives us that peace in the midst of adversity. God can give us that peace in the midst of adversity. And Job had that peace that passes understanding, amen? We can see he's a testament to that. In the midst of terrible adversity, he has that peace because he knows the shepherd, amen? He knows that who gives life. He knows who the destroyer is. Jesus has come that they may have life. That life, by the way, is eternal life. And it's available to every one of us. Job says, Job 21, verses 7 and 8. Why do the wicked still live? Continue on also become very powerful. It's a big question, isn't it? Why, God? Why, is this, why am I suffering? Why did I lose my children? Why did I lose all that belonged to me? Why is my wife even against me? Why do the wicked prosper? And I face this tragedy, and their offspring before their eyes. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Why? Why? You look at people, they like, you know, they curse God, and yet what, they live to a hundred years old. Why, why, God? Why? Job's real, isn't he? He's real. He has the human experience. And this is what Job says. Job 19, verses 25 and 26. He says, as for me, let's read it together. He says, as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will take his stand on the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh, I shall see God. Hallelujah. Amen. This world is temporary. We have an eternal home. Jesus is coming back. There is hope in the midst of trial, in the midst of the adversity, in the midst of heartache and grief and loss. God is on his throne. Our Redeemer lives. And there's a day coming when we will see him. He will reveal his mighty right arm. Amen? He says, Job says, even way back then, so far before Jesus Christ had come to this earth, he's looking forward to the second coming. He's saying, in, in my flesh, with my real body, I will see God. Amen? I will see God. He says, I, Job says, he knows the way I take. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. I will come forth as gold. I believe that God has a reason for everything. I don't understand it. I don't know why. I cannot explain it. But I can tell you that God is on his throne. And through the fire of tribulation, he's refining our characters. He's preparing us. And if we will allow him, we can confess with Job that we will see God. By his grace, through faith in him. The psalmist says in Psalm 68, verse 5, A father of the fatherless, a judge for the widows, is God in his holy habitation. That's our God, amen? Amen. That is our God. He is a father, the fatherless, a judge for widows. He is just and fair, merciful. 
In Psalm 84, verse 10, the psalmist says, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. I'd rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Even to be at the threshold. The threshold is just right outside, right there where you enter the door. I'd rather be there at the threshold of the church than down in the tents of wickedness. Better is one day with God than a thousand outside, David says. Jesus comforts us with these words. He says, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In this world you have tribulation. That's a promise we don't like, isn't it? There are some promises we don't like. But Jesus promises there will be tribulation. But he says, take courage, amen? I have overcome the world. Jesus says, I've overcome the world, and you can too. You can too. There's hope for us. Take courage. Take courage. Believe in Jesus. Put your faith in him. Have hope in him. Suffering is a result of sin and Satan. Don't put it at God's doorstep. Don't blame him for it. It's where we are today. It cannot be escaped. It's the world we live in. And without it, we would not be refined. God has allowed Satan a measure of control over the elements. I was thinking about December Sorry, December 10? Is it December 10? Uncle Lee, is it December 10? That is our special holiday in Hagatnya. Is that right, or December 11? Sorry. December 8, my apologies. December 8, on how the typhoon came after the legislature removed that holiday from the <laughs> Guam calendar. The, the um, government calendar had some religious holidays for um, government employees. The legislature removed that holiday and I'll tell you what, I believe the devil stirred up a typhoon just to bring it to Guam so that people would continue to believe in the devil's power. If you haven't lived in Guam long enough, you don't know what I'm talking about, but you can talk to somebody afterwards about that. But I, I tell you, right after that, the legislature put the holiday back because the devil likes to keep people in fear. The devil has some power, and, and it's only as much as God allows. Amen? But God is allowing, just as we talked about in the book of Exodus, God allowed those magicians to be able to do some of their magic tricks to, to make it appear that the devil has some power. And the devil is, he, he, he's a researcher, he's a scientist. He is able to cause some trials and tribulations. And we haven't seen anything yet. God is allowing the devil a measure for a time. And God is actually, his angels are holding back the winds of strife. Though we see a little bit now, there's a time coming where we'll see Satan's power in a much more powerful way on this earth as God allows the winds of strife to blow. Satan can bring disease and even death upon us. Satan can do that. I hope you're not going to end there. Please don't end there. Here's the final point. Jesus has overcome the world, amen? And he will help us overcome too, if we ask him to. He said he's overcome. And it's, it's implied in that scripture where he says, I have overcome. He's implying he will help you overcome even when it feels impossible to you. Keep crying out to him, reaching out to him, and he will help you to overcome. Amen? He will help you to overcome. That's the hope that I live for. It's the hope that I live for. That is my hope. I pray that it's your hope, and if you don't have that hope, I hope you'll talk to someone today and they can pray with you and you can reach out and take hold of 
Jesus' hand. Because adversity, if it's not here right now, it's going to come. Trials are going to come. And where are you going to stand? When you lose a loved one. When you are in the hospital bed with your last breath. When the typhoon comes and blows your house down and takes your sons and daughters. Where where are you going to stand? Only Jesus is going to see us through that kind of trial. Otherwise, you'll curse God and die. Jesus will help us. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you that Jesus has overcome this world and that he has promised us that he will help us to overcome. Father, help us to take hold of Jesus' hand at this moment, each moment of each day. We thank you, Father, that you're refining us, preparing us for your soon coming. Help us to, ready, to be ready, Father, to meet you and the clouds very soon. Please, Father, save our family, our loved ones, our friends, too. Use us, Father, as a witness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I wanted to share with you, I was going to ask somebody to sing this song. It's fine. 499. Okay. We're going to, after, I'm going to share the lyrics and then we're going to sing 499. This, this, I was going to ask somebody to sing a song, but I don't know if the, those who I ask would be able to keep their composure. I just wanted to share this with you as we close. It's a song by Jeff and Sherry Easter. It says, This life is borrowed, we're here and then we're gone. It's but a vapor, fades away before too long. Then, our sorrows, then in our sorrows we are broken and we grieve. But there's a promise for all who believe. We will trade our goodbyes for sweet hellos. Trade every tear for joy, only heaven knows. These light and momentary trials are only here below until we trade our goodbyes for sweet hellos. Time is precious. All we have is now, so don't waste it. Make every moment count because it passes. It gently slips away. Though for now it hurts, there will come a day. We will trade our goodbyes for sweet hellos. Trade every tear for joy, only heaven knows. These light and momentary trials are only here below until we trade our goodbyes for sweet hellos. We don't grieve as those who have no hope. There is comfort that we know. We will trade our goodbyes for sweet hellos. Trade every tear for joy, only heaven knows. These light and momentary trials are only here below until we trade our goodbyes for sweet hellos.